This is the Roaring Elephant Podcast for the 3rd of March, and here is my cybernetically enhanced co-host, <laughs> Yon. Okay, considering what you talked to me about when I presented this article and what you were saying you wanted to do to the people involved there, I'm not entirely sure how sh- I should take this, actually, <laughs> but let's just say I glow in the dark now. <clears throat> Fair enough. <laughs> so... We'll, it all will become clear later, dear listeners. Anyway. Depending on how long we run, because I mean, I remember the last news episode, we also did kind of this, uh, how do you call this, uh, foreshadowing of something to come, and then we kind of ran out of time, we didn't do the article, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you we'll go. See. Just goes to show. Perfect planning as always. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, if you haven't guessed yet, it's a new news episode, so we'll be picking a couple of articles and discussing uh, how we agree, or well, more than likely, I disagree. Uh, with the content of the article, I guess. But before that, we have some exciting news. Those we do. Old. Take it away. <laughs> we have announced a winner for our KubeCon, Cloud Native Con. I still think that name is too long, Con. Uh, free ticket raffle. <laughs> if you've been following us on Twitter, then you should have been able to at least see a couple of my tweets regarding this. And we actually have drawn a winner. And that person has, in this, uh, in the meantime, you should have gotten an email or a direct message from the Roaring Elephant. Giving you the good news and a little bit of luck, you've been in touch and you are all set to go to KubeCon in Amsterdam in the 30th of March. Congratulations to the winner. Absolutely. And just to let the cat out of the bag, it was a patron who won that ticket. As always, our raffles, our patrons do get first dibs. That's how we say thank you to our patrons. Whenever anybody gives us something to give away, we give it away to everybody, but our patrons, they get uh, first dibs. And if you want to get uh, a better chance at winning something, hey, just think about becoming a patron of the Roaring Elephant. You can support this great podcast and win some cool stuff. Yep, and there's other sort of uh, discounts available for stuff uh, on, on an ongoing basis as well. Yes, we've got a discount code in there as well. The moment you join a patron, uh, you get a piece of information from us, a dump of information with all of that good stuff in there. And with that, thank you to our patrons. And... Um, Good luck to our winner, and we'll see you at KubeCon. Indeed. So then, the news. Let's talk about O3. O3. God, that's no, 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 no. It can't be. Let's just talk about ozone. That's so, the same thing. and it is it is <laughs> ever so slightly strange to be reading a a Cloudera blog about ozone. Um, but you know, in the new emerged world, here we are. So this is. Um, article from February 14th with uh, Cloudera talking about the next generation storage for CDP. Um, Apache Hadoop Ozone, um, been around for a little while, um, still very, very early stages, and obviously came in to uh, really provide that next generation of storage to remove some of the limitations that uh, HDFS, it's... uh, very well-known, well-understood predecessor had. Yeah, and as you said, it's a bit strange he's in the Cloudera blog because uh, we kind of saw this emerge uh, from Hortonworks, of course, but Hortonworks and Cloudera being merged a while ago. But as you say, it's been in the working for a while now because I remember this popping up three years ago at the, the first memory or something. So this I think so, yeah. Uh, but I can imagine that the whole uh, merging together of the, the two distributions when the companies merged, that also took a lot of time, of course. I mean, you do that kind of stuff for synergy, optimization, but in the beginning, it's usually a uh, detractor to performance, let's say. So it's good to see that new well, stuff gets added to the distribution now. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 there's two things, isn't there? One is, you know, yeah, you've obviously got the uh, the impact of, of a merger, but secondly, you've also got the fact that you're looking to replace a fundamental part of, of a platform, and that is something that is definitely not done lightly. So I can I can completely appreciate, you know, wanting to wanting to take the time and, and make sure they get it right. Yeah, and of course, the, the uh, being really open source uh, minded here uh, they do make uh, ozone work uh, very well in parallel with hdfs so you can still have hdfs on your cluster and have ozone merged in take over stuff and have a kind of a rolling upgrade fashion if i can call it that uh, rolling up rolling migration so it does uh, allow people to play around with this 
But again, it's still early days to see how this works. It's still in beta. And, yep. uh, yeah, well, this blog post not, not, has e- a not even in yeah, not even in beta yet. It's actually scheduled for a oh, beta release beta. Uh, later this year yeah. with uh, CDP seven point one. So yeah, we'll see. So it's uh, alpha. But uh, yeah, this article has some uh, preliminary, preliminary hard word there uh, numbers <laughs> on benchmarks using the TCP. Uh, thingy uh, did i say the right tcp i always uh, yeah tpc i always i always reverse those two <laughs> cds uh, benchmarks and yeah i guess with our background in hadoop it was kind of fun to to revisit that old familiar neighborhood again and look at uh, the numbers they're presenting here yeah i mean the, the the thing that strikes me and this this could be yeah this very much just could be me misinterpreting the way that the um the information is presented, Probably. but it, 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 well, yeah, very much so. <laughs> but it, it, it looks to me like you've got around about 75% of the queries, they just say are faster. And there's sort of a statistic elsewhere that, you know, outperformed an average of three and a half percent. So let's say that, um, you know, roughly, you know, three and a half percent, 70, 75 ish percent of the stuff was three and a half percent quicker. Yet, you know, around about just over 20% of stuff was up to 25% slower, mm-hmm. with between two and 4% of the stuff being more than 25% slower. And, and again, this is, to me, this is one of those, you know, portrayal of the information things. I can't, I can't actually. Um, I can't actually decide whether all of this sort of massive um, change here is actually worth it. I mean, the the fact that it's talking about, you know, uh, an average performance improvement of 3.5% on both data sets, I guess that is, um, that's taking everything into account. So that's the performance improvements for the 75% and the performance slowdowns of, you know, 20-ish plus percent. Um, but I just, you know, I don't know at the moment, and I'm sure there's plenty of optimization to still come. Um, but three and a half percent for a giant overhaul of an entire storage layer is it, yeah. not, you know, it's, it it doesn't it doesn't fill me with uh, with delight and excitement. Um, you know, I I, <laughs> I would I would typically expect for a a complete, you know, a complete renovation of a brand new generation of storage, you would see something, um, you know, a lot a more, more significant than that, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I'd agree with that. And I mean, it's not like HDFS is, uh, is falling apart or has very huge issues with it. I mean, a lot of clusters out there run very well in HDFS. And that being said, a lot of Hadoop workloads have already shifted towards cloud block, block stores out there anyway using the WebACFS front end. So it is a bit of a question. Does Ozone actually yeah, make sense, solve anything? I mean, the one advantage I remember from from years back, which I assume still is an advantage, would be the size difference. HDFS did have a certain limit on amount of um, let's call it inodes and file sizes and things like that, which Ozone was supposed to uh, solutionize. I'm guessing that's still part of it. So you can go bigger. But then when you want to go bigger, a lot of these workloads have kind of shifted towards cloud uh, blob stores anywhere. Anyway, so... Well, yeah. so, so I, think there's a, I think there's a few things that mm-hmm. sort of, as I, as I hear you talking about this, come to light. So one of them is, I think... To me, these results are a testament to just, despite the fact how, uh, you know, some people might say long in the tooth HDFS is, it's a testament for just how good HDFS is yeah. and how HDFS has continued to move forward. We think about it as this this old, you know, quote unquote, maybe legacy technology, but really HDFS has continued to evolve um, as as the data platform has continue, continued to evolve alongside it. Um, the other thing is, it, 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 this comes from the uh, the article, there's a, a note around the, the beta release, and it does specifically say, which is which should be no surprise really, that um, Ozone as a technology would be, is scheduled for beta release along with 
uh, CDP, the Cloudera Data Platform Data Center Edition. So it, it's, it is very much, it is for those huge on-prem environments. It's not designed for cloud. To your point, doesn't doesn't make sense in cloud. You know, you can use, uh, in, a, in the majority of cases, for the majority of your data, you can use the native cloud storage for that. So, yeah, I, I think that this, this probably has a... Um, I mean, niche probably isn't the right word, but it has a targeted focus yeah. of of users that that will find this useful, compelling, etc. Now, when you just say the the, the 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 large data sets there, now obviously DPC that's a, that's a SQL, so it's a Hive um, on top of Ozone uh, database mm-hmm. uh, uh, benchmark. Looking at the two graphs here, they've run this on a, a data set of a hundred gigabytes and a one terabyte data set. Is it me, or is that not hugely massive? Or am I just looking at the past and with rosy colored glasses? I mean, no, I don't think that is particularly sizable, but you know, benchmarks take a long time to run. One of the shortcuts you can you can take is to uh, instead run smaller benchmarks just to yeah. get the number of results through. But so again, the benchmark should have meaning. It should have some useful information in there. And if you make it yeah short and pointless, then what's the point basically? Yeah. Uh, well. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Also wondering what's happening with uh, Kudu because uh, even Hortonworks and Cloudera are still apart. Uh, Cloudera kind of had Kudu as the replacement for HCFS, but well, that was more of a NoSQL kind of approach. And uh, Hortonworks had uh, this Ozone thing as their next gen HDFS. Uh, haven't heard much about Kudu anymore in the last couple of months. So, and with this now being added to what's it called now again, CDP. Uh, yeah, wondering what the future for Kudu look like. Something for our next uh, news episode, I guess. When a blog post comes maybe out on that. who knows. But apart from that, unless you have anything more specific to add, uh, they do have the uh, details of what they used for testing. It's somewhat detailed, could be better, but it's okayish, I guess. But apart from that, uh, I did like the old um, TCP, sorry, TPC, I hate that word as well, uh, benchmarks. We had a little bar chart for every query, showing a, a column mm-hmm. for every query, so you could actually see that which kind of queries had which kind of uh, impact mm-hmm. on the underlying technology. Because, yeah, as you say, these little graphs, there's nice marketing, I guess, but a bit of light on the actual useful information, let's call it that, perhaps. Yep. Yep. So, from uh, from benchmarks to dungeon crawling. <laughs> oh, let me get my helmet and my axe. Yeah, and uh, I'll get my uh, my wizard's wand. <laughs> so, Ooh, demonetized. Uh, oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> so, we are, of course, uh, well, not of course at all, unless you've been following this. We're, we're talking about AI Dungeon 2, uh, and uh, there was a... Now, this this sort of really erupted um, onto uh, onto the, the the universe back in March 2019 when uh, someone called Nick Walton built uh, put together sort of a a hackathon project called sort of AI Dungeon and the the twist and the reason that we're talking about it is because the the actions and everything else that you did. Um, was basically driven by some relatively simplistic uh, machine learning, but still very, very fun. Um, then um, something called uh, a GPT-2 came out, and this was the uh, um, the sort of open AI released um, sort of uh, 1.5 billion parameter GPT-2 model that was... Um, I can't remember what the particular word it was, but it was there were some sort of threats that this could destroy the internet because it could generate, you know, totally believable fake news in a heartbeat and just flood everybody with uh, with all of this uh, this totally believable fake news and it would topple governments and and crush nation states and and all of the above. Anyway, but we already have dropped um, that, so who cares? Well, yes, moving on. <laughs> so we. Uh, we we we're still here. Um, the world hasn't ended, hurrah! Yep. Um, but uh, Nick took the uh, the GPT two model and uh, and then started to plug it into his his new iteration of uh, AI Dungeon, Inven- in, uh, innovatively called or um, yeah, 
called AI Dungeon Two. <laughs> so, same sort of same sort of premise, um, but uh, but again, fully driven by this very very advanced uh, model. So, you know, all of this sounds sounds fabulous, and I would thoroughly recommend that uh, that anybody that is vaguely interested in sort of text based dungeon crawling adventure and even if you're not you should go and just have a little poke at it because it is a lot of fun um but uh, this article which is a medium article you know talks through uh, in a little bit more detail um you know some of the challenges that scaling something this had so um you know he obviously released this um onto the world it was in a, a sort of a google collab notebook uh, that's how the the actual environment would run um and it you know made perfect sense you know collab was you know it's free um and you get a free gpu instance um to to run the uh, the model and you know all is all is well in the world Except it's not quite that simple, and you know he'd forgotten to um, take account of the fact that there were sort of data egress charges, and sort of every collab notebook you'd have to download a five gig model, and then you know all of a sudden uh, it went from like a two thousand dollar a day bill up to uh, fifteen thousand, twenty thousand, thirty thousand. 50,000 in in three days so it sort of the the popularity of this service just absolutely went bonkers and you know as I say quite rightly it, it's a it's a fantastically fun kind of way to to kind of lose yourself for a little bit of time as you you sort of explore and, and do weird and wacky things um, so it was there's you know a variety of things that that he talks through in the article you know moving the the kind of the model sharing to like a a peer to peer solution um you know converting the um converting the environment to more of like a, a microservice sort of architecture out of a out of a, just a, a pure sort of ml model and then continuing to to scale this um forward so i think you know he's he's got uh, over a, a million users now and and it continues to continues to grow so there's i just think it's a it's a great it's a great story it's a great article um i think i honestly think it's a really great project i have <laughs> i've actually spent just sort of half an hour just plinking around you you just completely define your own random sort of scenario that you want to your dungeon to be and then off you go and it's it's just yeah it's phenomenal so i think it was a it was a great story um and it sort of like a lot of things you can learn a lot from from other people's failures and how they how they then uh, come back stronger and and sort of find a way around it yeah i think it's a nice example of a, well, maybe not so serious nice example of the problems or difficulties to productionize machine learning stuff because yeah. we've talked yeah. about data gravity a lot and things like ingress, egress uh, costs and the costs associated to egress and ingress. That's also part of that data gravity thing, right? And all that machine yeah. learning, if you don't... from the, I mean, this, of course, started as a hackathon, so you didn't have any long-term views. It's a hackathon. It's supposed to be a thing you build just for the fun of it. But a lot of machine learning and AI stuff actually starts that way in a big company as well because somebody has a silly idea to check out if he can do something and turns out it works and it gets put into somewhat production-ready state and then things start hitting a lot of limits and uh, yeah, cost barriers and things like that. And then the positive news in the article here, uh, positive news for the world and uh, not just for this guy, is that apparently... Uh, there's some tooling happening now that uh, makes mm. it not um, probably not easy because he does say at a certain point uh, I'm using uh, Flask, Docker, Kubernetes, and a mess of services. <laughs> so it's still yeah. not as plug and play as might should be, and uh, maybe it should be. But um, it's at least possible now to have a. Uh, I'm not going to say ill-conceived, because again, it was a hackathon. It never had any intention of being something long running at that point. But even if you start with that's in situation there are ways to now make this at least feasible with a bit of hack uh, hack work and have this actually run and service 
thousands, uh, well, he's talking about million, uh, six weeks later, he passed a million users and six million unique, unique stories told, which is uh, a pretty massive scale, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm particularly interested um, to to sort of find out a little bit more about this thing called uh, Cortex, which is a project from seems like Cortex Labs, which you know takes a takes a machine learning model, um, wraps it in an API, containerizes it, provides you a method to deploy it to the cloud, exposing you know an API as HTTP endpoints. I mean that that little just that little bit there. Is is something that um, you know people have been st- coming up with a variety of different ways to productionize ML models mm-hmm. over you know a, a whole a whole host of different methods, and you know this this seems like you know one of the latest iterations. So the fact that it's tied into as you as you said, you know, Flask, Docker, Kubernetes, whole bunch of AWS backend stuff. Um, I think it's very, very cool, and it's it's a it's a nice it's a nice use case. It's a nice it's a nice story that it's telling, and, and I'm really interested to see how this will continue to grow. Because by all by all accounts, uh, AI Dungeon Two continues to to grow and scale. And there's actually now um, uh, a sort of a Patreon, and you can sign up, <laughs> and you you you, know, you don't need to even link. You know, you don't need to use the collab notebook. It's you know, because of the way that they've built it into microservices, you can just use their web browsing. Uh, you know, just sign in with a web browser, and away you go. So it, it's uh, it's it's a great, great sort of uh, great journey that they've been on, and I look forward to see where it heads next. Yeah, you just want to play games all day. Just admit that. Well, yeah, clearly. I mean, <laughs> why not? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyway, so. Moving from dungeon crawling to uh, cyborg crawling. jellyfish. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a bit of an article. When I found this, I uh, I sent it to you over uh, social media, over a little chat app here. and I, I think I said, I'm not entirely sure what to think about this. Uh, it's a thing I found on the Scientific American, and it's titled Cyborg Jellyfish Could One Day Explore the Ocean, and it's actually about a bunch of scientists that put electrodes on jellyfish to be able to steer them remotely. <laughs> <sighs> There's so many things to be said about this. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I don't even I don't even know where to start. So, I mean, this this just this just seems terrible on so many, many levels. Um, I mean, the, the, these sort of electrodes, they're, they're, they're just fitted to the jellyfish with a, a wooden pin thrust through its body tissues. You know, no big deal. Let me just shove a, a cocktail stick through your arm just to fix this. It'll be fine. Um, uh, I mean, I, I, I understand the desire to map the ocean and and be able to you know know more about uh, about our environment and all that kind of stuff I completely understand that um, but this just this just seems wrong on so many levels um, and I I get you know they they talk about the fact that the uh, jellyfish have no perceivable um, reaction to it despite the fact that they were moving twice as fast as um as as usual and expending twice as much uh, energy as usual i i mean oh I, it's just it's just wrong on so many levels i mean yeah i i i really uh not a fan i think is is where i land on this one yeah, it's uh, for me. It's one of those questions. Uh, it, 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 it's not a question if you can do it, but if you should do it. I mean, uh, yeah. I, I eat steak. I, I wear leather shoes. Yeah. I'm not a bleeding yeah. heart. I, I have respect for everybody. No problem there. But this is like, what's the use? I mean, yeah, you can explore the bottom of the ocean with this stuff. Great. So what? Maybe if you don't use living beings to do this stuff and wait ten more years to have electronic stuff that does that for us, have you lost something there? Well, in this case, yep. it's like a. As I said, it's they they found a way of doing something, and they just did it without actually really having a reason to. And it doesn't matter if the the animal doesn't feel it or not. It's also, I mean, this is not what the animal 
combined in nature would do. So it's still going to have some kind of impact on the poor creature, even if it's a jellyfish and I yeah. hate jellyfish. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think there. Yeah, I just, I just think there's the. It's the ethical question of. Great, you can do this. Fabulous. Um, should you do it? No, definitely not. What on earth are you thinking? <laughs> well, I, I do see one possible use case for this. And okay. I, I'm just thinking about this because I read an article earlier uh, this week about uh, new Nike shoes with carbon soles that make runners go faster, stuff like that. I think, actually, this is special training equipment for, for synchronized swimming. <laughs> Because in the little so, gift there, so, yeah. So, so wait a minute. We'll we'll just we'll just shove this wooden spike through your body just to secure this. Don't worry, it won't hurt a bit. All of a sudden, no synchronized swimmers anymore. They all decide it's far too dangerous a sport. Uh, yeah, I mean, anyway, don't want to go too deep on this article. It's more of a thing. From time to time, I mean, technology is great, and I love the way how it all advances and and and. and allows new things and I mean I've got a lot of technology here on my desk as well and I enjoy it very very much but sometimes you read something where you think really? Yeah indeed So anyway on that note On that note I think that is definitely all the time you have for today <laughs> I'm going to remove my electrodes and tell you you can support this podcast by becoming a patron <laughs> we do not insert pa- electrodes in our patrons there's no risk there at all <laughs> Every contribution does help us. We're on YouTube. Like, subscribe, hit the notification bell, do the YouTube stuff, make Dave happy. You can go to www.roaringalpha.org and find a link to that Patreon page, a YouTube page, and a lot of other information regarding this podcast. And you can follow us on Twitter as well using the at Roaring Elephant tag. You can send uh, your feedback as well to podcast at roaringelephant.org if you're still using that, uh, I guess, outdated email system these days. <laughs> Until next time. My name is uh, no electors, please. Jon. <laughs> and my name is please somebody loosen my shock collar, Dave. <laughs> and we look forward to talking to you in the AI generated uh, dungeon that is the Roaring Elephant podcast next week. Goodbye. See you then.